you for coming to tonight's Student Research Spotlight featuring Lexi Miller's presentation on her library prize winning paper, The Long Misery. Troubled Masculinity in Edith Wharton's Ethan Fromm, with one M. Lexi's presentation explores Wharton's critique of early 20th century discourses on masculinity in the novel Ethan Fromm and how these discourses impacted the narrative of the title character. Using a mixture of literary criticism, theoretical text, and historical material, Lexi's sophisticated use of library materials created an exceptional paper. Lexi is a senior majoring in English and a smart research award winner whose recent works include a study of queer and black identity in 19th century United States. After graduation, she plans to attend graduate school to pursue a PhD in literature. Do we know where yet? No. Okay. Still flying. Still flying. All right. The annual library prize is designed to honor students who d demonstrate sophisticated research skill by incorporating information found through the library's resources into original scholarship. It is one of several outlets for showcasing student research at IU South Bend. Whether somebody is thinking of applying for the library prize, a SMART grant, or have their work featured in the Undergraduate Research Conference, or the Undergraduate Research Journal, library faculty are here to assist you in meeting your research goals. Whether it is helping a student begin their research through research consultation or helping them locate a difficult to find but desperately needed resources, we're here to help you. Uh, at the end of the event, please take a few minutes to fill out the evaluation form and your feedback's always important to us. And also we have lighted for refreshments in the back so we want you to eat, eat, and eat some more. All right, so information on the library prize is back at the table, as well as information on how to get help from one of the librarians. Linda's, feature, Linda's picture is featured on the handout, and Lexi's paper is also there for you to peruse. So here's Lexi. All right, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Like, this is my first headlining feature sort of <laughs> talk, right? And like, it's a wonderful night out, so I'm so glad that you decided to spend it here instead of outside. Um, but, so my paper is on troubled masculinity in Edith Wharton's Ethan Frome. And so before I start, I want to open with a disclaimer. This is off of a social media site. Um, if you can't read it all the way in the back or whatever, it says the number one pet peeve of all academia related to literature, when men are characters but women are symbols. This is me in this paper. I did this. Don't kill me for it. Um, as a feminist, like, literary theorist, user, whatever, um, I recognize my significant fault in treating women solely as symbols in this analysis. Um, but anyways, so has anyone here read Ethan Frome? All right, two people. Awesome, that means I can actually talk about it. So this is Ethan Frome. Um, he, there's actually a movie based off of this book. Um, he's played by Liam Neeson. So this is from like the early 90s, I think. Um, so this is before Liam Neeson became famous as like an action movie star. So like when I found out it was Liam Neeson, I was really confused, but... Um, yeah, exactly. Like, it kind of makes sense when he's younger like this. Um, so anyways, Ethan is a, let me see, where am I? Sweet. Ethan is a guy in this like small rural town. Um, he comes from a long line of farmers. And basically he's like, I don't want to live on the family farm anymore. My entire like lineage has lived on this farm. I'm going to leave and go and study engineering. So he goes to study engineering and he comes back because his father dies and his mom is ill, so someone needs to work the farm. So he's there and he works the farm um, and in order to take care of his mother, this woman, Zena, um, or Zinnia, I think she's called both in the book, um, weirdly, shows up basically in order to be her nurse. Um, so she takes care of Ethan Frome's mom and then Ethan Frome's mom dies and Ethan's like, crap, I'm gonna be left here all alone. So he's like, hey nurse, please marry me. And she's like, no, I don't wanna be stuck here. And he's like, no, no, we'll just marry me and we'll get out of here in a couple of years. And she's like, okay, fine, no big deal. And then they're stuck there for several more years. And so 
Xena starts to fall ill as well after they get married. So that is roughly when like the main plot of the story starts is when this woman, Maddie, shows up. So Maddie shows up in order to take care of Xena, just like Xena showed up to take care of Ethan's mom. Um, they're cousins. She's basically just there in order to be a caregiver. Of course, there's a problem because, you know, Maddie is super pretty. So all of a sudden, we have the classic love triangle going on. Um, so Xena has... Xena is disabled. Ethan and Maddie are doing this weird flirtation and everything. Ethan has this huge conflict between his commitment to his wife and this new, beautiful, perfect blonde woman who just showed up out of nowhere. So they get all intimate, basically, and all of a sudden, while Sozina finds out about all this and is like, she needs to go, Ethan is taking her to the train, they stop in order to take a sled ride for no good reason. <laughs> She's like, hey, let's have a suicide pact. He's like, okay, that sounds like a great idea. How are we going to do it? Let's ride the sled again, is basically what they decide. And so this is actually from the film. Um, it's only about a 15 second, 20 second clip. Honestly, I find it hilarious rather than tragic. Mostly because of how it's shot. Yeah, so, so there's a little bit of a smash-up, and it's called a smash-up in the text, which is really hilarious to me. Um, the problem is, is they do not die. Instead, Ethan basically breaks his leg, and Maddie is paralyzed from, I believe, the neck down. Um, if not the neck down, is paralyzed. Um, and then, so basically, she comes and stays with... Ethan and Xena. Xena starts taking care of her, and Ethan is trapped there for the rest of his life at the end. Um, and that's basically the story. It's a very happy story. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, very Disney like. Um, so, it's part of a genre known as naturalism. And so, naturalism is a subset of American realist fiction. Um, and one of the things that I came across, not during this research, but during other research over the summer, is that naturalism really existed in opposition to British literature of the time, specifically like Oscar Wilde. Like the Americans were like, well, Britain sucks, we rock, we can't be like Britain, Oscar Wilde is hilarious, let's be really depressing, is basically part of the logic behind it. And so there's a couple of overall themes that show up throughout. Um, I actually took this off of the Washington State University on naturalism in English literature, which is a really great site. Um, but the most common themes, and these are the ones that mostly the most show up in Ethan Frome, are survival, uh, determinism, which I'll get back to in a minute, violence and taboo, nature as an indifferent force acting on the lives of human beings. And this can mean both like external nature, like the environment, and also one's internal nature, like biology and personality. Um, the forces of heredity and environment as they af affect and afflict individual lives, and an indifferent deterministic universe. Um, so the determinism is a big part of this text, and also the weird aspect of naturalist fiction to me, because you wouldn't think that America, in its early like time period in its like first hundred years would be like, what is the kind of genre fiction we want? One that says everyone's life is crap and free will doesn't exist. Um, and that seems really backwards. But I have some thoughts on that the more I've been thinking about it, but I'll get to that towards the end. So genre is naturalism. It's a terrible story about people dying, well, getting disabled. What does it have to do with masculinity? So. The novel shows multiple forms of masculinity competing with each other inside of a single person. So in uh, gender theory, there's an idea that there are multiple forms of masculinity. It's hierarchical. Basically, you have the most valuable form of masculinity, 
in American society that's like middle class, white, Christian, straight, uh, cisgender, able-bodied, up on top. Any other form of privilege you can think of, up on top. And then everyone else underneath it. And so this shows actually that there are other hierarchies of masculinity inside of that hierarchy. So Ethan Frome throughout the entire text is just this working class farmer schmo, basically. But his problem is he can't figure out which kind of working class farmer schmo to be because there's so many competing ideas of what a working class masculinity should be. So Ethan ends up battling with himself to determine which masculine code to follow. So there's the rural farming masculinity that he starts with. There's the scientific engineering masculinity that he really wanted to get in on. And then there's the idea of the Western frontier masculinity, which is, you know, John Wayne um, and, you know, go out to the West, be all independent and rugged, and you will truly be a man if you do this. And so his anxiety is about which masculinity fits him the best so that he can get the most prestige. So one of the main texts that I use was uh, Michael Kimmel's Manhood in America. So he describes American manhood as chronically anxious and a temperamentally restless form of manhood that carries with it the constant burden of proof. So in other words, masculinity is not something that is set in stone. It's something that you are constantly working on because it can be taken away like that. Men who subscribe to these notions are afraid that others will see them as less than manly, as weak and timid, and not measuring up to some vaguely defined notion of what it means to be a man afraid of failure. So in other words, masculinity is less about being something than not about being something else. Generally, we think of that as the positioning of masculinity versus femininity, but inside of masculinity, it's about being the right kind of masculine versus the wrong kind of masculine. So uh, this chronic sort of anxiety about being sure to live up to the right kind of manhood leads men like Frome to act in really self-destructive ways. So for example, Zena recognizes Ethan and Maddie's budding romance, demands Ethan to fire her as a nurse and go get a new one. And so Ethan is walking around like trying to figure out what he's going to do. And so this is kind of a longer passage, but the important part is his manhood was humbled by the part he was compelled to play, that there were confused impulses struggling in him, and he had made up his mind to do something, but he did not know what it would be. So his uncertainty, his wife forcing him to act in this particular way, um, what his desired woman, right? Like he's worrying what Maddie must think of him. and his own like need to be masculine all lead to him making his mind up to do something but not knowing what that something is and so that's like really pitch perfect masculine anxiety to me like he knows he has to do something but he doesn't know what it is but he's gonna do it anyway because he has no other choice so one of the ways that um, he attempts to gain a prestiged form of masculinity is by traveling to the West. Um, this is an ad for land in Iowa and Nebraska. And so these sort of ads would have been showing up in newspapers all throughout the 1800s, basically. And so the idea is he's going to go out to the West with Maddie um, and basically prove his masculinity out there. Because if you can make it in the rugged land of the West, clearly you're a real man. So Kimmel describes how the late 18th century was full of this kind of commentary about how you head out west, you're going to prove your manhood. Um, and we still carry that with us today, considering the archetypes of you know, the cowboy, which then gets translated into the modern American action hero. So Ethan is the sort of poor farmer who's exactly the sort of person who's going to get drawn to this idea that hey, it's cheap, I can get out here, I'm gonna prove my manhood this way, start a family, it's gonna be great. And he actually even recalls a story that he heard about someone else nearby who did, strangely enough, exactly the same thing that he had to do, 
right? This guy his own age had to escape from a life of misery by going west with the girl he cared for. So again, this idea that this narrative keeps repeating over and over again, right? It's in the advertisements. It's going to be in fiction during this time. And he actually knows a guy who supposedly did it. So he goes digging for an advertisement. He's stashed away. And so he reads the, quote, seductive words, trips to the West, reduced rates, like sort of scans how much it's going to cost and realizes, well, I don't even have that little bit of money to start. And so basically he gets really ticked off because he's so poor he can't even be a good poor man. Like he is that unmanly that he can't even go and prove his manhood in the one way that poor men had to prove their manhood. And so um, you can also note that he displaces his desire for this masculinity onto Maddie. Like he's not mad because oh, I can't go out and buy some land. Oh, I can't get off this property. It's, oh, I don't have the money to take her there. Like, this is all about her, um, rather than being about him who is wanting to get off the farm forever. So that's one of the forms of masculinity that he considers. The other major form of masculinity is farming and engineering masculinity. They both show up. The farming's a little bit more of an important point. But um, basically, Country Boys is a collection of essays. Um, and the editors are Hugh Campbell, Michael M. Bell, and Margaret Finney. And so a lot of it's sociology, actually. But what I found really useful was in the introduction, when it talks about how there are farming narratives of masculinity, the idea of the farmer who struggles to survive against all odds, and how this farm then survives because of a tough farming masculinity that endures and goes on enduring hardship. So this narrative provides more of this masculine prestige of like, I'm working hard for my family, I'm using my body to do all of this work to a job that's kind of terrible. So it provides men with some level of masculine prestige, but not as much as, say, going off and being a rich man who can do whatever he wants. So Ethan brushes up against this narrative most explicitly when he's walking alone through his family's graveyard. Like his family has been here for like long enough to have their own graveyard. And so, like, the level of explicitness in this is crazy to me. Straight up, there is a tombstone that says, sacred to the memory of Ethan Frome and in endurance his wife who dwelt together in peace for 50 years. And I really don't actually have an interpretation of that because it's so explicit that I can't really interpret it. Like, his parent, his grandparent, I think it is, great-grandparent, was literally married to endurance. And so... Once again, though, he, the text then collapses this idea of what is a good form of masculinity into a woman's body between endurance, his wife, and then the second line, which is, with a sudden dart of irony, he wondered if, when their turn came, the same epitaph would be written over him and Xena. So again, there's this connection between a certain form of masculinity and a woman's body. So. Again, this provides him some form of masculine like prestige, I guess. But the thing is, he never really wanted that masculine prestige, since, as I noted before, he didn't really want to be in agriculture. He wanted to be an engineer. And so this is one of the only times in the text that we get his own opinion that's not tied to connecting masculinity to a woman's body, right? Like. The going out to the west, you have Maddie. The farming, you have Xena. This is the only thing that seems like it's really his. And it's there and it's gone. Like, it's only in the text for maybe this line and one other line when it just shows up where he's like, damn, I should have stayed in school. So his desire for engineering died when he was called back to the college to provide for his poor family, again, connecting his income and his lineage to this immobile masculinity that he cannot escape. So now, this whole thing gets to the end of the text where we have the abject masculinity. So um, Kimmel at one point states that manhood is less about the drive for domination and more about the fear of others dominating them, in this case men, and having power or control over men. And so, 
obviously that's a problem with how we construct manhood, that you absolutely must be in control at all times. And so masculinity, of course, gets positioned against femininity. Like, how can men prove they're in control? Well, control your opposite. And so in the final bits of the text, right before um, Ethan and Xena end up like saying, OK, well, we have to get rid of Maddie, Xena gets really, really ticked off. Um, and so we get this amazing set of text. Ethan looked at her at lo with loathing. She was no longer the listless creature who had lived at his side in a state of soul and self-absorption, but a mysterious alien presence, an evil energy secreted from the long years of silent brooding. It was his sense of helplessness that sharpened his antipathy. There had never been anything in her that one could appeal to, but as long as he could ignore and command, he had remained indifferent. Now he had ma she had mastered him, and he abhorred her. So when Xena finally lashes out at Ethan for being a total jerk and like wanting to go out to the West and everything with another woman, Ethan at first characterizes her as this alien unknowable force, right? Like she's something that he cannot, where am I? He cannot comprehend this idea of a woman dominating him. And so he's like, okay, not a woman anymore, an alien, there we go. So upon mastering him, Xena becomes something that Ethan abhors. But then the text goes on, and right after this, we get this line. All the long misery of his baffled past, of his youth of failure, hardship, and vain effort, rolled, rose up in his soul in bitterness and seemed to take shape before him in the woman who at every turn had barred his way. So this is what I mean by, like again, women becoming symbols and stuff characters in my analysis. But at this point, like, he at first turned Xena into something alien, something that he absolutely couldn't understand. But that's only because she actually represented something he very well understood, the fact that he could not get what he wanted. That no matter what he did, he would not be the form of masculinity and the sort of man that society wants him to be or the sort of man that he wants to be. She becomes this weird, like, twisted like funhouse mirror that's like showing him everything that he loathes about himself and that's why he hates her. So in dominating him, Xena then reflects Ethan's broken manhood back to him and thus reveals how poorly constructed his manhood was in the first place. And so it's this realization then that leads to Ethan's self-destruction when Maddie's like, hey, let's commit suicide and let's go on a sled ride at the same time. And therefore, he can't even get that right though, right? Like he can't even commit suicide right with this woman. He breaks his leg, he gets her paralyzed, and everything is awful for the rest of his life. So this links back to determinism, right? So this idea that your decisions are entirely constructed by your biology and your environment. And so, Ethan is trying his absolute best to reject this rural working class manhood and take on a new life. But he undermines himself constantly, right? And so he adopts all these patri patriarchal values and norms uncritically and unreflectively. And so he ends up repeating his same mistakes over and over again. So for example, when Ethan is leaving to take Maddie to the train station, Warren describes how Ethan wants to be there when she's sick and when she's lonesome, which is exactly what Xena is. Xena is sick and lonely and wants someone to pay attention to her, basically. Wants them to actually take care of her. And he's like, no, I'm gonna take care of this woman who doesn't need my help who just showed up yesterday. When Ethan married Xena, the couple agreed that they would sell the farm and sawmill and try their luck in a large town. What does Ethan want to do with Maddie? Go off and go to the wilderness. Exactly what he said he would do with Xena. So again, repeating his own mistakes. And even the circumstances mirror each other. Ethan met Xena when she showed up to help his mother. Ethan met Maddie when she showed up to help Xena. And of course, by the end of the text, both Xena and Maddie are disabled because of Ethan. And so Ethan's masculinity ends up destroying himself, and it wrecks the lives of these two women. Um, 
one of the characters at the very end of the book says that the trio are all shut up there in that one kitchen, and it's Ethan, Ethan who suffers the most, which I would not agree with this character particularly, but it basically shows that this one man screwed everything up over and over and over again because he couldn't break this constant loop where he wanted to get out of the position he was in, but he couldn't. And so where my personal analysis has evolved somewhat from my original like paper is determinism and naturalism, like why does that make sense in an American context, right? Why are we writing texts where people cannot get out of the position they're in because of nature? And it seems to me, personally, that would be because we need to understand why in this home of the free and everything where anyone's supposed to be able to make it, tons of people don't. What can we blame that on? Their biology and nature itself. The idea that there's a specific fate for these people and that's why they are stuck in that fate over and over and over again. Um, so my analysis has evolved a little bit since I wrote the original paper, but like, that makes sense to me. Um, the other thing about this reading is there's like pretty much no room for positivity, like nothing good ever happens. Um, the other problem with this reading I've mentioned before is the women in this text basically just become more forms of masculinity, which is kind of messed up. Um, so a better reading of it would focus more upon those women. But what it does provide is a way to understand how masculinity structure where we value one form of masculinity over others and then make it impossible for people to like move, causes men to harm themselves and women too while they chase this narrative that supposedly is going to provide them prestige but instead kills everyone anyway. So that's basically it. Thank you. I was wondering whether you have, I know you've probably done work on modern literature too, or more contemporary literature. I was wondering whether you think that um, the concept of masculinity in American culture has changed a lot or, or not? Not particularly. I mean, I think there's some level of, I mean, there's always been some level of valuing of like the working class, right? Um, there's a reason why the frontier narrative is such a huge deal, like it's not, rich people who are supposedly going out and being cowboys, it's supposedly the poor, right? And that's our ideal American masculine figure on some level. Um, but I would personally say not really. I'd say that it's adapted a little bit so that like, you have characters like um, John McClane, right? And the Die Hard movies and things like that where it's you know sort of an average Joe who just happens to become like somebody but there's always something special about him. And no matter what, the form of masculinity still comes down to a form of dominance and power. Um, often, especially I feel like lately, violent power more than anything else. I have a couple questions for you. Um, if you could talk a little bit about um, the research that you did in writing this paper, and then I also know that um, you've been doing some uh, smart grant research. Um, it's very interesting where you use a lot of um, primary source material. Yeah, so a lot of my research on this paper was actually more theoretical and scholarly. Um, while I did reach out in order to, for example, um, I didn't quote it in this, and I don't think I quoted it in the paper either, but um, you have had, gosh, I can't think of which president it is off the top of my head. Um, Roosevelt? No. The speak softly and carry a big, big stick guy. Theodore. Yeah, Theodore Roosevelt, um, who would have had the sort of like um, the masculinity of like the West going on, right? Um, and I also looked through and found like advertisements like the one that I showed. Um, but mostly I would have done scholarly research such as um, finding books on masculinity theory, finding books about theories on how rural masculinity specifically works, finding theories on like what had already been written about Ethan Frome, which actually surprisingly, there's not a lot written about Ethan Frome and masculinity. Um, 
the one that I found was actually one that said that masculinity grows rather than being very rigid, like I would argue. Um, whereas the research that I did recently was much more focused on primary text. The, my research over the summer was about a, practically the opposite of this, a black cross-dressing poor sex worker who had sex with men in New York in 1836. Um, and how this person was depicted in news reports about them getting basically picked up off the street for being a sex worker. Um, and so my experience doing research on that involved a lot of contacting our research librarians, other research librarians, um, a lot of ILLs, a lot of finding books that I don't even think were in our IU library, but I had to ILL from other libraries, like a lot of doing searches based off of key terms, like I ended up using amalgamation a lot because it came up a lot in my text. Um, so very different, but also very similar at the same time, where I still needed to like reach out through many of the same sort of spaces like our online research libraries and such, but just towards different sources. Um, I was really interested in, in what you were saying about the farming narratives, how there's this idea that it's always the farmer and he has to fight to make land productive and it's him against nature, against the elements. And um, we know that the parallel between a farmer and fatherhood is pretty readily apparent. You know, the farmer plants a seed and the seed germinates and the land gives birth. But what I found really fascinating about what you were saying and also simultaneously troubling is that the land doesn't want to produce. The elements don't want that to happen. He has to fight and force it and never give up. And only through his masculinity can the land give birth. So am I reaching too far here in positing that this is also a, an articulation of uh, a justification of, of marital rape in a way? Ooh, honestly, I would not say linking it to reproduction is that far of a reach, um, mostly because Xena throughout it is regarded as frigid, right? She's literally cold. Um, she literally wants nothing to do with her husband. She's constantly mocking him. Um, and at the same time, the actual land, like the time when this text is set, is winter, right? It's literally frozen. It's literally not really possible to be farmed. Um, going so far as to link it to marital rape, I don't think there's quite enough like text that links it directly to sex in that way. But I would definitely say that there's something in there on how masculinity is connected to reproduction as much as femininity is, but masculinity requires, and men require, another person basically, right? And if that person is quote unquote frigid, you can't quote unquote plant your seed. Um, so I could see if the text was written perhaps today even, where there would be more of that subtext, but I personally never quite made that jump, but that's actually an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, he made some terrible choices. If he had made some of those choices, he would not be in those situations. So it seems like, you know, part of it is he made a bad, first bad choice by going back home and then right there. Everything else went down too. So he could have done nothing. Yeah, um, so the actual text was written in 1911. Um, it's unclear when specifically, like, the text takes place. Um, there's no mention of cars at all, if that helps a little bit. Um, but there's nothing that really sets in a particular time period. I would personally put it somewhere around like the late 1800s, early 1900s, right? And like on the one hand, he makes really bad decisions, but on the other hand, he there's a reason why he feels forced to make these bad decisions, right? Like what sort of son 
like if we're looking at a masculinity, right? What sort of masculinities does the son who looks at his mom, who is now going to starve and die on a farm, not go back and work the farm, right? Like that makes you a terrible son. And so he has to do that. Like what sort of husband leaves his wife for another woman? Like that's also not something you're supposed to do, right? What sort of like, um, what sort of, descendant are you if you leave your farm that your family has worked for however many years right and all those tie back to masculinity as well and so like the problem is, is that there's no good choice right like if you're in this sort of position in the first place you have no good option because no matter what there is a form of masculinity you are not succeeding in making and that's sort of like the trap of being a margin in a marginalized discourse even if it's just like white working class masculinity is no matter what you do, you're still perpetuating it somehow because that's just how the interlocking like mechanisms of discourse work. Like you leave, you're a bad husband, you don't leave, you're not a real man because you're working on a farm your entire life. So And he didn't have children, so the end of the line is can't Yeah, that too. So he couldn't even yeah, and I, I wonder if that's not part of like the idea of, oh, look, here's this happy little like 20-year-old girl that is totally in love with me, too. So, yeah, that's actually something that I didn't notice until I was preparing for this speech was, yeah, he doesn't have any other kids. Like, he's the last of his line as far as manhood goes, so. Yeah, but that's why the suicide key makes more sense, because he doesn't, he's can't Well, thank you again, Lexi, for your excellent talk. Thank you.